Hey everyone, I'm Mark Sargent and this is Flat Earth Q&A emails number 123, where you send me your Flat Earth questions to msargent23 at comcast.net. That's M-S-A-R-G-E-N-T 23 at comcast.net. Let's get right to it. The first one's called, I agree, Tesla car in space, rant, quick email. It's literally what the title is called. The, Mark, the Tesla car in space could have had some sort of endorsement. Even the guy who skydived from space was smarter than Elon Musk. He got Red Bull to back him, and he's probably a multimillionaire by now. Well, I don't know about that. Also, why was there not one mirror on that car? Yeah, they didn't show any of those mirrors, uh, especially the rearview mirror, which was gone entirely. They have the budget to launch a car in space, but they can't keep the three small mirrors in the car. They har hardly weigh anything. I doubt it's about cost and trying to minimize weight. And that's from the Cisco. Cool, man. Thank you for that. This one's called Earth Movement and Seismometers, Seismographs, and Gyroscopes. Mark, good evening. My name is Corey. Not sure if this has ever been mentioned before on your show. I had been looking into how seismograph or seismometers with regards to measuring movement of the Earth from earthquakes. I have been in several earthquakes in Afghanistan, and when the Earth moves, you can definitely tell. I know earthquakes range in size, with some being very small, where movement is harder to tell or notice. I can't imagine how you would ever get a stable reading on a seismometer with the constant movement or rotation of the Earth, especially near the equator or at a thousand miles an hour. Now, science may say something like, well, calibration level adjusted for non-recorded motion input. However, this would be almost impossible to input with a factor value that would be accurate or reliable based on simple on simply too many variables. Next to a seismometer, the gyroscope would have to be, this, be some of the most sensitive reading instruments. I have operated gyroscopes with the U.S. Army Field Artillery. I figured since you said you were in Afghanistan, you'd be U.S. military. Uh, using survey device gun lane positioning system, the GLPS. I, I've never heard that one. And they require non-motion to get a reading or to be able to be put on, in survey. Any movement the device will not record or measure accurately. Food for thought. Best regards, Corey. Yeah. Thanks, man. That's awesome. Moving on. This one's called Flat Earth. Hi, Mark. I just watched Behind the Curve and found your email address on the YouTube page. Yeah, You know, I had no idea that Netflix was that much... Uh, that far above all the rest of the others. I've gotten so many emails because of the Netflix release of Behind the Curve. I mean, compared to, remember the other big four, right? Amazon Prime, it's not small. Uh, Google Play, not that many people use Google Play. Uh, YouTube movies, which you'd think somebody pick up uh, a few things there. And, uh, oh boy, what was, the, what was the fourth one? Google, Amazon, Google Play. I can't remember the other one off the top of my head. I'll you know what? I'm going to look it up right now iTunes. Jeez. Can't believe I forgot iTunes. But again, how many people use iTunes for movies? I think most of the default one nowadays has got to be Netflix. So anyway, it's on iTunes, Prime Video, YouTube, Google Play, and Netflix. Anyway, let's get back to it, shall we? Uh, let's see. Um, I hope you don't mind me emailing you, you with a few questions. I just stumbled into hearing about Flat Earthers somewhat recently when YouTube suggested that I watch some videos from No Doubt Your Favorite Guy, Simon Dan. <laughs> Until watching this doc, I'd never really seen or heard anything directly from Flat Earthers, but rather only heard about Flat Earthers indirectly from Simon Dan's videos. Full disclosure, I'm not a flat earther, not even close. I do agree with Simon Dan that you guys did come off as likable folks in the movie. Anyway, despite not buying into the concept, I have wondered what flat earthers think about certain things. There you go. That's what the movie does. It gets people thinking. So if you're willing, would you mind letting me know your thoughts about, uh, one, do you believe in the existence of other planets? Uh, no, only as lights in the sky. Let's just stick to the ones we know, Venus, Mars, Jupiter. Uh, if so do you think they're just balls or discs? Uh, they could be balls or discs, but either way, they're just lights. Uh, two, the sun and moon. Do you think they're balls or discs? I'd like to think more they're balls than anything else because I think it's a three-dimensional light source because they're both individual light sources, but they could be discs. Either way, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. Three, are there... Wow, he really keeps going on this one. Uh, three, are there any extra... 
extraterrestrial bodies like planets or stars that your community has identified as flat rather than balls. No, no. Again, I, we believe the world that is presented to us and the same thing with the universe. So when you go to a planetarium and you see the moon on the ceiling, it looks like a sphere. However, you know full well it's not a sphere because it's just a projection on the ceiling because you are you have enough uh, perspective that you can you know you walked outside of the building. We don't have that perspective here. So whatever they tell us is in the sky is usually what we believe and that's what's changing. Number 4, what I'm really trying to get at with numbers 1 through 3 is the is Earth the only object, planet, stars, or community has identified as being flat? Yeah, it's the old thing. So why is the Earth flat and nothing else is flat? I feel like I've seen images with ball planets and a flat Earth, but never a flat Earth and other flat objects. Five, I've heard the theory that the sun and the moon are close to the Earth, but how high up do flat Earthers think the sun and the moon are? Uh, even if close, why wouldn't the sun illuminate the entire Earth? Because it's really, really small. Again, take a tiny, tiny light source. I mean, if it's less than 50 miles wide, that's what people keep missing, which is forget about the sun's uh, altitude. It's the size that matters in this case. Uh, if the sun is less than 50 miles in diameter, all it has to do is go off into the distance. Six, on a flat earth. Oh, wow, he is really stuck on the, on the sun and the moon. But we'll finish this out. Uh, how did the sun and the moon move around? Uh, I noticed the models your friends build me the sun and moon seem to go in flat orbits in roughly the middle of the flat earth. Perhaps that is just because it's an easier way to make the models. Yes, that's it. Is that the belief? No, not necessarily. Uh, what makes them do that? Are they contained? Wow, he is, it's really in his head now. I feel bad for this guy. Kind of. Uh, if they weren't contained, would they float away? No. No, it, the whole thing is a giant building. Do you know of or believe in some sort of rule by which the sun and the moon operate in their behavior or vis-a-vis -vis the flat earth? Wow. Uh, seven. Uh, he's only got a few more. Seven. Why do so many flat earthers also seem to dispute gravity? Uh, what ties the two belief systems together in your opinion? Why is there, at least it seems, such a fight around, about gravity? Everyone believes things fall to Earth, right? If so, why do flat earthers seem to be so motivated to prove that this is not because of gravity, but because of some other mechanism that makes everything stick to the Earth? Again, what does mainstream uh, science say is gravity? They will tell you it's some magical invisible force that pulls things down. And for me, gravity is some magical invisible force that pulls things down. It's a molecular magnet. That's it. And software simulations, that's what it is. We create physics engines that simulate what we call as gravity, which is this magical force through software that pull things down. Uh, eight, what did you think about the documentary? How about the 15 degree hour drift issue? Uh, that was editing. If you have any questions about that, talk to Bob. Uh, the the 15 degree hour drift issue. Okay, the bigger question here is, does the Earth move or do the stars move? And I challenge anyone to do this because human beings are really bad at perspective. Watch a time lapse of the stars. Just type into YouTube, time lapse of stars, and then tell me, are the stars moving? Are you moving? And the reason why everybody thought for a long, long, long time that we lived in sort of a snow globe is because we can't feel the earth moving. So, you know, it, it's one of those weird paradoxes. It's like, okay, if we're on this solid ground and the sky is moving, well, then it's the sky, right? And then science came on later. It's like, no, 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 it's not the sky. We're moving. Everything else is stationary. And over the course of generations, that burned into our heads. Oh, as far as what I think about the documentary, uh, I think it's a great introduction for people that have never looked into Flat Earth. And I've seen this, I, I know this as an absolute fact, because I've been in the, the audiences in different cities and countries when they've watched it. And they've everyone has questions. Everybody has questions. Now, if you're a Flat Earther, it's not going to help you in the slightest. Uh, I mean, it's kind of cool to see people that you that you know and, and you know, sign a, kind of follow the progression of how Flat Earth went along. Anyway, moving on. Uh, this last question. Nine, how do you feel about the Mariners off season? I'm fairly annoyed by it, but I'm hoping for the best this season. Take care, Todd. Okay, one that gives away Todd's location because if he cares about the Mariners, and that's the United States baseball team in Seattle, then he uh, he's in the Seattle area. Uh, I don't... Honestly, I haven't followed baseball in a long time, which is interesting because uh, it's one of the few professional sports that isn't rigged. Uh, everybody knows when it comes to the three big sports in the United States, uh, football, basketball, and baseball, 
In football, you can call holding anytime you want and change the pace of the game and the momentum of the game anytime you want. In basketball, you can call a foul anytime somebody drives the lane. Uh, but when it comes to baseball, it's really only the strike zone. I mean, yeah, of course, you can you know uh, close call it first or close call it second. You can do something there a little bit. Uh, but now with instant replay, uh, it's it's really, really tough to do. It's really only the strike zone that is that is in question. And now that's all digital, too. So, uh, but I don't follow baseball. Sorry, it's, it's too slow. The American version of cricket. Okay, this one's called Smiley Face. Hello again, Mark. So my husband and I have been watching old Home Improvement episodes on Season 2, Episode 11, starting at the 14 minute, 15 second mark. There's a pretty interesting truth slipped in there. You should check it out if you haven't already been made aware of it. P.S. I was listening to one of your TFR episodes and you had mentioned a quote by Mark Twain. Another interesting fact about me, I've spent my entire life living in America's hometown, the boyhood town of Samuel Clemens. He was also a Freemason, which may or may not have been a bad thing. I'm still in the air on that one. If you ever decide to plan a trip to Hannibal, let me know. I'd very much enjoy giving you a tour. Thanks again for all your hard work and bringing light to the darkness. Sincerely, Elena. Cool. Thank you, Elena. That's much appreciated. This one's called Westbrook Ice Disc. Mark, discs occur in nature. Globes are far more precarious. For example... Bubbles last only seconds. See the Westbrook Ice Disc in Maine. And that's from Matt. Cool. I will look that up. This one's called Gravity. Mark, I may have a model to explain gravity while watching a drone in an elevator experiment. I thought, that's it. In the elevator experiment, the drone crashes to the floor when going up and the, ceil and the ceiling when it goes down. Now, Picture the flat earth model with dome as the elevator car. If the land dome is rising at that rate of nine inches per second, free fall speed, everything would appear to be sucked down to the land where in fact the land would be rising to any object. Why are we rising? Pic picture a snow globe at the bottom of a pool and you let it go. It would float to the top, creating that same effect on a snow globe. If there is water above the firmament, then that makes sense. Gravity solved. Next. Thanks, Scooter. P.S. I run some movie theaters in South Florida, and do you have a contact for showing the movie in theaters? Thanks again. Oh, wow. He added that at the end, and I will forward that off to Caroline Clark over at Behind the Curve. This one's called Prepper Question. Electric vehicle should be in the next edition of Empty Shelves. Hi, Mark. Okay to read on air. If you have time, I would ask you to f please view this video, which argues that there are, there are many advantages for preppers to consider owning an electric vehicle like Tesla, Leaf, Volt. Uh, one, will be hard to get gasoline in an apocalyptic scenario. Two, if you have solar panels, insert plug for DITRH here, can change vehicles at home. Three, will give you 100,000 miles of battery efficiency, assuming you can charge at home. Four, provides a relatively long-lasting source of power for your key items at home, fridge, cell phones, etc. Five, very low engine noise allows for stealth in dangerous areas during those situations. What are your thoughts? Can I earn a spot in the next edition of Empty Shelves? Take care, Jack. Hmm, you know what? That's not bad. Uh, I mean, I know, I, I mean, I actually may mention it in, in empty shelves, but I think people are going to figure that out naturally because two, th two reasons why, and I don't want to dwell on this too much because it's a whole other topic, the whole end of the world. And if you guys again want a copy of a survival guide, I'd be happy to send it to you. It is uh, called empty shelves and, and it goes over stuff. Um, the the two, two big problems with, and, and all movies get this wrong with the apocalypse, which is gasoline has an expiration date like milk. Uh, I think you're about a, after about a year, it starts getting a little ragged and that's pretty much it. Now, I, I think airplane fuel may be able to go a little bit longer. And of course you could get airplane fuel in a, in a car, but that doesn't really matter. After about a year, you're not going to see a lot of cars on the road. And after probably the next five years, if, if anything lasts that long, um, you're not going to be able to do anything anyway, because you're going to have to compression start everything because, uh, batteries, car batteries only have a lifespan of six years and then that's it. So, and if you have an electric car, you do have to change those out. It's, you're not gonna be able to use it forever, that's for sure. Will electric cars outlast gasoline cars? Yes, but you all, here's the problem though. You've got to feel, figure out a place to charge it. And you're saying, oh, I'll just see where I'm going with this. I say, oh, I'll have to, I can charge it using my generator. 
at home. It's like, yeah, but that generator runs off gasoline. And unless you own a refinery, uh, fast forward to or flashback to the Road Warrior movies where that was the only one that made sense because they were actually in a refinery where you could make gasoline, basically fresh milk on a regular basis. Uh, so if you don't have gas to run your generator, what are you going to charge your electric car with? See what I mean there? It's going to be kind of tricky. I mean, electric car is not bad. Don't get me wrong. You're you're going to be able to use that longer than than you think and and probably extend your your if you have, you want to use gas for other things that the electric car would be a great solution uh i it, i but it's not the perfect solution but honestly you know end of the world scenario you're going to be thinking about all sorts of other things okay moving on this one's called what's this one called hello serious questions Hello, Mark. After looking to this for, uh, for almost four years, I came to the conclusion we do not live on a spherical Earth. So much so convinced, I found Chris Pontius and ordered number 60 flat Earth model, which is absolutely amazing. The day I posted footage of it on my Facebook wall, I was asked a question I had never come across. I have been searching for a logical, reasonable explanation since that time. The Flat Earth Society blog forums were no help. Shock there. Similar, similar questions were asked, but no one was giving an answer, mostly just bullying. My son asked me, how is it that's, oh boy, here we go. Santiago, Chile is much shorter distance in flight time to Sydney than Vancouver to Sydney. I actually talked to this guy on the phone. I looked at the flat earth maps and saw that it was true. Vancouver should be a closer flight, uh, be a large margin. I looked more and found this anomaly with other southern cities. I researched the matter, then came to understanding trade winds. Tailwinds, jet streams, nautical miles, land miles, travel speeds, east-west winds, heights of flights. I suppose I can understand the time matter, but the distance matter is way too glaring. If you can help me, please do I want to give this logical response. Currently, my answer is too simple. All maps are incorrect, including FE. No, that is that is the answer. You have to give them. Uh, we know the Flat Earth map has got some big problems with this perspective. We know this. Uh, but we don't know because we can't get, uh, you know, because because we can't look at it, we can't adjust it. And some people have been trying with three-dimensional maps, pff, having a tough time with it. Uh, I'm racking my brain trying to understand the mileage, so on and so on. I need help. Chris Pontius indicated uh, to me he would share the concern. Wasn't sure if you got it. Uh, thank you, Mark, up front. Hoping your research, which is vastly superior to mine, can answer this. And that's from Jody. And yeah, that's the, the big thing is, you know, with distances, you're okay. Two, two things real quick. One, the map is got some problems perspective wise, because we don't have a completely accurate map. I mean, the, the AE map is a great place to start. Uh, the second part is the GPS system cannot be trusted. Period. Uh, the GPS system, which is supposedly a military system designed by the United States government in the 1990s, 30 plus satellites, blanket coverage. And yet that system drops off as soon as the planes get off of land radar range, which is about 150 miles. So you can't prove the routes, which is why I did Clue 9 called The Magic Show. You can't prove the routes. Latitude and longitude drop off, and they should not. They drop off, period. And for all flights, if there is no landmass between uh, your, your takeoff and your destination, even Hawaii, even the Northern Hemisphere, you see that. If you're leaving from San Francisco to Hawaii, people don't know this. You're getting, you get about 150 miles offshore, your plane blips out. Uh, your latitude and longitude go into approximated or estimated mode, which means they don't know where you are. They know approximately where you are, but they don't know where you are. And the pilots, of course, they keep feeding them stuff, which they have to adjust on a regular basis. But that again, it's only approximated. It's only there to make the pilots feel better. Moving on. This one's called Netflix. Mark, the Behind the Curve documentary is on Netflix now. That's from Matthew. Yes, you're absolutely right. It is. And I did not know, honestly, until about two days beforehand, because I was watching uh, the producers being interviewed. And uh, I did not know that eventually that thing was going to come out on Netflix. So now it is officially everywhere. What I hadn't counted on was how much of a market share Netflix has. Uh, and they must have promoted it because there's a lot of, I mean, tons of emails that came in. But people have never even heard of Flat Earth. They just saw it. I don't know how it's, I don't have Netflix, so I don't know how it's being advertised on Netflix, but it grabbed the attention of a lot of people. Uh, this one's called Good for a Chuckle. Hey, Mark, I was at the record store feeding my vinyl addiction and busted out laughing when I found this record. Those around me didn't get the joke. Lately, it seems all my inside jokes have an in-group of one, uh, but say la vie, uh, ever flat word, Tim. And yeah, it's a vinyl album, Admiral Bird, The Steel 
guitar magic of of Jerry. Oh no 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 no. Okay okay I'm sorry. It's admirable bird. The steel guitar magic of a. Uh, there's an artist named Jerry Bird. B Y R D. Uh, that's actually pretty good. Admirable bird. That's really good. And on the, the and on on the Monument record label. Wow and it looks like it's from the late fifties. Late 50s, early 60s? That looks like the artwork they did back then. Steel guitar music, nice. For a second there, I thought Emerald Bird cut an album. This one's called Nat Geo Clip. Hi, Mark. Two months ago, I started watching Flat Earth videos and was shocked to see some of my own lifelong questions uh, being answered in a logical and mathematical manner. My response was to initially become angry, thinking not only have we been lied to and controlled for so long, but God has put us in an elaborate ant farm. My husband already thinks I'm a bit wacky. He affectionately calls me E.T. <laughs> so I was depressed for about two weeks because I can't tell him about this. I'm emailing you because I appreciate your vision and steadfastness and also saw the video you folks did on Nat Geo. Yeah, that was a hit piece, but of course it was going to be. It's Nat Geo. They're the, they're the television network of science, in my opinion. Uh, were any of your group out on the water with the people in the boat with the three-line sign? Yeah. Yeah, we actually sent a guy out there, and not because we wanted to, because it, it's a toxic lake. And they use a, uh, an inflatable raft. Nobody wanted to go out there, but we sent this kid out anyway. Uh, we asked for volunteers, and I wasn't going to go out there. Um, uh, let's see here. Because it sure looked like they were dipping it down into the water, especially since the actual water line behind the boat was higher than the dip line of the sign. Absolutely. Being an artist, I know that these lines should have been straight across and even with each other just saying yours, Sherry. Oh, yeah. Not only that, Sherry, but they wiped out the first experiment. Remember, we the these experiments were not ours. They were the debunkers. And the, the first one, they completely om omitted from Net Geo, which was the balloons on the other side of the lake at about 10 miles where we saw them with cameras and they should have been over the side of the curve and they uh they just removed it entirely it's like that experiment never happened uh because they it didn't show well on television and so there's your there's the power of editing that and i talked to him for three days straight I, you know till my my voice cracked and they uh, they removed almost all of it they used me for what maybe not even 120 seconds of footage and, and they, the, the worst they got, I mean, I mean, again, creative editing. I gave them all sorts of great points. They used none of it, especially when I was pointing out in the distance every 30 minutes saying, look, those mountains now look like islands and everything, the, the atmospheric distortion and atmospheric lensing is bleeding everything away. We could see, I was there at 530 in the morning. You could see the lights on the shoreline from 10 miles away. Clear, clear as anything. And uh, nope, weren't going to use that footage either. So, whatever. Slideshow. Hello, Mark. Can you send me the slideshow, please? Greetings from Sweden. And that's from Krister. Yep. That was, uh, he's talking about the slides from Just Jack. They even wants the, uh, the Just Jack slides, uh, where Jack says you can put them on your phone and, and uh, plant the seed in anybody's head. He says he can convince people in 12 slides. I don't know if that's true, but maybe. This one's called Moon Creators. Mark, question for ball earthers. The moon is smaller than earth and somehow has a very concentrated amount of craters. Why haven't we witnessed a single impact on the moon? How is it that earth has zero concentrated amounts of craters when we're a much bigger target? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's from Donut Viper. And yeah, not, not only that, you want to, we'll take it a step further, which is uh, why are all the moon craters 90 degree angle impacts? Meaning uh, you only get perfect craters like that if it, if it comes in straight down, straight down. Nothing's coming in at a 45 degree angle or 60 degree angle. Nothing's skidding off. Uh, you know, if, if anyone knows about anything about target ranges, you know, you get these shallow impacts and we don't see any of that on the moon. It's like the moon was freaking decorated. Like it was, it was just drawn or built. And then with the craters, you know, decorated really nicely and then put up there. And people, yeah, yeah, of course, the two things. One, of course, why are all there, why are there a ton of craters on the moon and hardly any on the United, down here in the, in the world? I mean, there's one in Arizona that everybody knows of and everyone says, oh, the Gulf of Mexico is a crater. It's like, yeah, but where's everything else? We got a lot of deserts everywhere. So where are the craters? When did all this happen? Exactly. Uh, don't want to get into it. This one's called flat smacking. Mark, I'm still not in a position to be able to fully identify myself as a flat earther, so first name only, please. 
I just want to thank you once again for your hard work and dedication to the Flat Earth. You're the only person who I perceive to be fully honest with us and not attempting to persuade us to adopt a certain specific model other than the certainly accepted azimuthal equidistant map set under a dome. I've been a proponent of Flat Earth since first hearing your Flat Earth clues in April of 2015. I am currently hospitalized short term and I'm flat smacking all my nurf nurses and doctors. I've been pleasantly surprised to find several people who were already hip to the Flat Earth truth. This is quite surprising considering I reside in a small town in Arkansas. I am finally realizing that you are right about the subject achieving a critical mass and eventually the 100th monkey effect. I have now made sure to make all my friends who dare watch behind the curve on Amazon and or Netflix. You are fortunate. F we are all fortunate for you to be able to commit your life to promoting the truth. God bless you and hail Hydra. Leon. Thank you, Leon. It's much appreciated. This one's called another question. Hi, Mark. I was curious about some things like Halley's Comet. What exactly is it and how do they predict that? And also, what about meteor showers? How do they know when they're, go when they're going to be? How can they predict that? Because if we are flat and stationary, I'm trying to understand this, explain it to a colleague as I'm trying to explain flat earth to him. Thanks for your time. I listen to your show on YouTube all the time. I'm a big fan. I always look forward to your videos. Keep up the good work. That's from Wes. Okay, first off, you got to remember the sky is a giant clock system and the meteor showers are part of that as well as the lunar and solar eclipses and so on and so on. Halley's Comet, very, very interesting because it comes every... 75, 76 years. I think the last time we got it was in 1986. I, I think I remember I was in uh, uh, university. My first, I was drinking my first year of university then. And uh, yeah, it, what's more interesting about Halley's Comet, if you really want to dig into it, is think about the entire solar system flying sideways at half a million miles an hour, right? Well, Halley's Comet supposedly exits the solar system and then slingshots back into it and then goes around the sun and leaves the solar system and, and slingshots back in. What exactly is pulling that thing from all the way out past Pluto? And you're saying, oh, it's gravity. It's the sun's gravity. It's like, really? It's pulling it and then it's accelerating to where it overtakes the sun. Remember, it's flying sideways and then goes back out. I... I what what physics engine is is controlling that 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 makes sense to you? It, sorry, I mean if if the solar system is flying at half a million miles an hour sideways, whatever leaves our solar system, uh, it should be escaping all gravity at that point. And even if you could say that it's that it's the gravity's grabbing onto it, it's not going to slingshot it back towards the sun. I'm sorry, it doesn't have any velocity of of its own. I mean, yeah, if you were some sort of space cruiser you know, with, with extremely powerful engines, which is a whole nother thing, because what's it pushing off against? Well, let's say you had an engine, then maybe you could slingshot around the sun, uh, aka Star Trek. But if it's just a rock, how exactly is it overtaking the sun at half a million miles an hour? How is that happening? So, sorry, I have more questions than answers there. This one's called Compass Question. Mark, I don't understand the confusion about using a compass to navigate on flat Earth. If north is a big circular magnet in the center of the world, then everything works fine. Facing north, east is to your right. If you traveled east, using a compass to constantly keep north to your left, you'll travel in a circle and come back to where you started flatter globe. South is behind you when facing north. If you travel due south from any location, keeping your back to magnetic north, you will eventually arrive at the Antarctic ice wall. Can you please tell me why that doesn't work? I hear a lot of fumbling around from flat earthers when speaking about the compass and magnetic north. And that's from Eddie Jacobus in Parsnippany, New Jersey. And uh, yeah, no, I, I've never had a problem with the compass. The compass works fine. Compass in the North Pole, magnetic north works the same on a flat model as it does a globe model, period. And and we've we've done this. We've done the test where we put a magnet in the center of a map and we take a compass and, you know, a flat map and we just move it around and it, it works perfectly fine. And that's how it's supposed to work because it's not going to conflict with the globe model. Everybody can navigate just fine. What's interesting is the South Pole magnet. Because you remember, there should be a magnetic south. And yet, in fact, there was a video that just came out recently and it confirmed what the Australian intelligence officer that I talked to a couple of years ago said, where he goes, look, there is no magnetic south. It's always north. 
North is always the dominant force, and it shouldn't be. Remember, you have a North and a South. But when you get, he goes, you go into Antarctica, and, and the video showed this. A guy was in Antarctica trying to use a, a compass. And he goes, yeah, the compass does not do what you think it, it should do. It should dominate South, especially if you're in Antarctica, you know, the cl really close to the South Pole. Nope, doesn't happen. Okay, this one's called Watch a Compass Proofs. There you go. Watch a Compass Proofs Flat Earth on YouTube. Short and sweet. All you have to do is look that up. And that was the guy in Antarctica. Yeah, perfect. It was weird, the guy that wrote me just before that. That's from Jamie. Thanks for sending that, Jamie. This one's called the EM Field... Oh, Electromagnetic Field Ice Dome. Hi, Mark. I've been listening and watching off and on for almost... Since the beginning. And am amazed to the clarity I now have to my faith in the word of truth as he is witnessed in the Bible account. Thank you for your help in that. Have you come across the theory of the EM vortex spiral energy field of the earth being responsible for the freezing effect of the waters above forming the ice dome as it refracts the plasma wave discharged from the earth as the catalyst? Catalyst? catalyst off the dome uh yes i have as it is absorbed back into the em field on the feedback loop the light conversion forms the laser focal point effect that produces the sun yeah yeah uh, in fact jeffrey grupp has kind of gone along those lines uh this theory explains everything except the stars and the so-called planets that is understood if one includes star in a jar oh uh, yeah star in a jar it's very good that's part of the equation the moon is just a reflection on the dome formed from the light uh, of the dome off the center ice nodule, 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 under the ice dome. It phases and moves with the swirl of the plasma waves. It moves in a figure eight pattern while the HTO ice dome rotates under the influence of the EM field effect. Um, cool. Awesome. Your friend and fellow meat suit, Bruce. <laughs> nice. All right. This one's called Send Me the Survival Manual. Dear Mark, thanks for all you do. We would be honored to show you the power of the emotion code. And that's from artesianwellnesshealth.com. Her name is Wynette. And yes, I sent her the survival guide. This one's called Acquiring T-Shirt. I am Mark Sargent. Hello, Mark. I got your email from YouTube videos of your research. And I find it fascinating. And I do believe the earth is flat. And was wondering how to get a I am Mark Sargent T-Shirt. Would love to own one. I'm sure you get a lot of things like this. Hopefully you don't think I'm messing around. I really do believe. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, if anyone wants to, uh, to you got to buy one. It's not for me. I, I don't sell any t-shirts or mugs or anything like that. Uh, but I know people that do. Uh, and one of them is the peanut gallery that uh, helps me on the Strange World show. If anyone wants one, uh, all you have to do is, <coughs> sorry, email me. I need a drink of water. Email me and I will forward it off to him. Just say, I want t-shirt and, uh, and then I'll forward it off to him and he'll send you all the info. And it's a good shirt to wear because not a lot of people would know what that meant. I am Mark Sargent. You wear it around. It's like, wait, what does that mean? Is that some secret cabal? And the answer is yes, it probably is. Okay, this one's called Survival Guide on Coast to Coast. Hello, MKS. The answer to Antarctica's 24-hour sun is they're taking footage from the North Pole because in the summer, the sun is closer to the middle of the Flat Earth model. Keep up the great work. Keep it flat. And that's from, it's Luigi from Montreal. And I, I should probably mention this, and I'll probably mention it a few times. Uh, I had a hard drive crash recently, which is sad considering this is an alien where r7 the, the drive was that two terabyte drive was, wasn't even nine months old and it just died now i granted i was working it pretty hard because i'm making a lot of videos and doing a lot of stuff but it shouldn't have died i replaced it with a solid state drive but i did lose just so you guys know uh, my coast to coast interviews so if anybody because i sent my coast to coast interviews out there to a lot of people if anyone still got them on their machine could you please let me know and send it to me through dropbox or i'll or send it to me through we transfer because uh, I'd love to have uh, those on file. I mean, I don't listen to them very often, but people ask for them. And currently, I do not have any on this machine. Either one. Uh, the one with George Nori from 2015 uh, or the one with Connie from 2018. I'd love to have either of them. So if anyone has them, please don't throw them away. I'd love to have them back because I did lose a few things. This one's called 3D Map Generator Terrain. Hello, Mark and Jaron. 
I get a lot of those. I get things that are copied to myself and Jaron and Bob and Rob Skiba and so on and so on. Uh, not sure if you guys may have already seen this. I found it on YouTube. It's how to create a 3D terrain map in Photoshop. It's by Orange Box CO. It would be awesome to put together sections of the entire US and show the flat curve. That's from Rick. Uh, cool. Awesome. And yes, thank, thank you for that, Rick. He's out in Illinois. This one's called, Yes, It's Flat. Mark, this is an email for you. Please forward. Hi, Mark. At first, many greetings from Germany. And yes, I'm a believer as well. Do you already think about a very simple tool which is working all over the earth and always always correct? Here in Germany, we call it, oh boy, Wassenwage, English spirit level. Uh it's, they spelled it in Germany. It's called Wassenwage. W a s s e n w a a g e. Uh, this is the ultimate evidence for the flat Earth for me. Best regards, Stefan. Yeah, yeah. People, D Marble has been using the spirit level with great success. He's getting a lot of attention with that thing. I mean, heck, his first video got a million. I think it's over a million hits. Now, a lot of people gave it negative hits because these guys they thought he was crazy for doing that. But uh, this one's called Flat Earth. Mark, just saw your video on Flat Earth on YouTube. Just trying to put my head around this. Are you saying that Antarctica is surrounding the edge of the dome we live in? How do meteors strike the Earth? I was just wondering, Brian. Uh, yes, it is, it, Antarctica is surrounding us and meteors. Uh, what's interesting about that, you want to see some, some interesting stuff? Go on YouTube or, or anywhere and see if you can find me anyone that recorded. Remember, there's 6 billion smartphones out there. Find me a video of a meteor that actually hit. And that will remember that one in Russia from three years ago, uh, of all the things that didn't hit, it blew up in the sky. Find me a meteor that hit recently. Uh, and you know, some, any footage, like even if it, if it goes behind some trees and you see the smoke plume, you know, find me that it's weird that we don't see any impacts from meteors. None. I, yeah, you'll see some shooting stars every once in a while and, and occasionally something will cross the sky, but nothing Nothing impacting. I thought very, very fascinating. I mean, what, what's more rare, a, a meteor impact or an astronaut in a, in, a, in a suit in a vacuum chamber? That's a tough call. This one's called Survival Guide Request. Hey, Mark, please send me the survival guide. Thank you for all your work, Margaret Bell. Well, Margaret, when you put Survival Guide Request in all caps with three exclamation points, I am going to take notice. This one's called Sun and Moon United. How, how has the video gone, Mark? Saw that you put me in there a little bit, by the way. Oh, from Sun and Moon. Okay, I, you know what? I probably shouldn't have read that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond to her and then I'll email her as well, which is, I think she's talking about the documentary. Uh, saw that you put me in there a little clip, by the way. I had nothing to do with the production of that documentary. I didn't do any editing. I didn't, I wasn't behind the cameras. Uh, I didn't even pick the locations. It was all done by Daniel Clark and Caroline Clark. Uh, and it was edited by Nick Andert. And uh, so, it, it, hey, l l love that you give me credit. That, that There's a lot of people. There's a lot of montages. And there's a lot of flat earthers and trolls uh, that are in that documentary. But I had nothing to do with who was chosen for those montages. But I will write her back. This one's called NASA's $1 billion Jupiter probe sent back new photos of the giant planet and its great spot. Yeah. Uh, Mark, please look at this. And I still can't get a Wi-Fi signal in my backyard. Kind regards, Adam from England. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, but the bigger story there, I mean, there's, there's your story. Literally the first line of that headline, which is uh, $1 billion Jupiter probe. You want to know why NASA does what it does? There you go. You get paid a billion dollars to actually do nothing. Free money. <laughs> uh, it is literally free money uh, in that in that case. they got they got Of course, they built something, but did it cost them a billion dollars? Uh, no. So who, where'd the rest of the money go? And of course, how are you beaming it back with what technology, what bandwidth are you sending back images from Jupiter? You're not. Uh, this one's called, we should talk. Hello, Mark. I believe we should talk. I think we could really help each other. Kindest regards, Robert, CEO and founder of Tachyon Aerospace. <sighs> no cliffhangers, please. Uh, if you're going to give me something, especially since I can't confirm, I mean, he had no, 
Uh, there's no footer here from Tachyon Aerospace. You should have sent me a lot. You can't just say that you're the founder of an aerospace company. Sorry, uh, you're going to have to give me more than that. And plus, if you've, if you've got something on your mind, two, three things here. One, no credentials listed at all. Two, no mission statement at all. And three, um, why there's a conflict of interest there, which is, okay, an aerospace company wants to talk to a flat earther. How is that going to be helpful to you in any way, shape, or form? Sorry, you're going to have to give me more than that. This one's called Big Ben Size Asteroid Will Skim Past Earth Tomorrow in Close Flyby, Traveling at 30,000 Miles an Hour. That's a British newspaper. Mark, better hide under the table. Kind regards. Adam. Yeah. yeah. Again, that's just another story that we are we put out there. Okay, first off, 30,000 miles is not that fast in the grand scheme of things. Uh, an hour, although, and if the size of Big Ben is skimming close, the, the, the space industry's term for close is way different than what we consider close they consider close less than a million miles or even in some cases more than a million miles uh and, and we would consider close you know enough to work could take take off the side mirror off your car that's what we consider close the average person on the street this one's called the seed hi mark when i'm Already here in front of the keys, I might as well ask for the survival guide. Oh, please tell me I sent it to him. Oh, good, I did. The uh, I've been listening to you for one year and three months. You are an have an incredibly calming voice, and I believe, and believe it or not, it has since been equivalent to ASMR in my case. Yeah, I could see that. Also, I generally just like your brain and how, th how it brings up new ideas and angles I wouldn't have thought of myself. Thanks for being cool. <laughs> I never would have said I was cool. I have a problem. Flat earthers often talk about the infamous seed. I've had the seed planted in, in me early on, and I found the concept of flat earth unbelievable and ridiculously fascinating. I could research the subject for hours. Regardless, <clears throat> I could not get convinced or flipped and finally just landed on the conclusion that I frankly don't care and don't see what difference it makes whether the earth spins or not, or if we live in a lie or not. Uh, we live good, right? Unwrapping the truth, I can't be sure, is there just seems risky to me. I guess you could say I'm just a boring person, and yeah, that's pretty accurate. Either way, I'm prepared and up for the ride if the potential truth unfolds itself. Despite my current stand, I'll keep including flat earth content to stimulate the spectator and skeptic in me. Here's my questions. One, have you ever speculated what will happen when the flat earth community, with the flat earth community, if the earth turns out to be a globe after all? Uh, nothing. I mean, but if it was going to happen, it would have happened in 2015. It's 2019 now. Uh, the concrete is pretty much solidified. Nobody's got anything. Space has never uh, brought anything to the table to convince us otherwise. In fact, it's just gotten worse and worse. So I don't even think in those in those terms. But people have asked me that before. It's like, what happens if you're wrong? It's like, I don't know. We just go back to our lives. Uh, but if we were wrong, why are we still talking about it? You know, uh, especially in your case, like you said, you've been in for a year and three months. And, uh, you haven't disproven it even to yourself in, in that long. And I know you say, well, I don't really care. We live a good life. Most people don't. To quote a line from the Matrix, human beings tend to define their reality through misery and suffering. Most people aren't having a super fun time, so the flat earth does mean a lot to a lot of people. Uh, question number two, and the last question. You obviously have a wonderful community with meetups and conventions filled with nice people. Do you think some people turn flat mainly for the community or to be part of a community? Or is the community more of a perk bonus for being a flat earther? Do you have any thoughts? Thanks. All the best, Christopher from Norway. Uh, yeah, Everyone that gets into the flower community, you can tell this, it's really easy to spot, uh, is that they get into it because they, they, they're, they're flat smacked. The, the flatter changes their paradigm. It changes their perspective. And you can always tell people they're just trying to coattail us. Uh, a perfect example would be, and I'm not going to pick on them too much here, but would be Mad Mike. And I'll, I'll, I'll divulge something to you guys because if you listen to my email show, you know a lot about me, which is that there was a radio station that called me about uh, a month and a half ago. And they said, yeah, we'd like to have you on to talk about Flat Earth. And they said, the reason we want to have you on is we had Mike on twice. And we're just not feeling it. 
And the producer basically said that whatever my, that Mike was just kind of going through the motions. He didn't have any conviction. That's what you can always tell. A true flat earther has conviction. Uh, people that are just kind of along for the ride, they might be able to say a few words, but they don't. They're not. They're not feeling it. They're not believing it. Conviction. You can always. You know. I know some actors can portray conviction, but that's why they're actors. Uh, in, in Mike's case, he put a sticker on the side of his rocket. He was all about the rocket. That's all he cared about. Rocket, stuntman, girls, money. That's all he cared about. And then people started asking him because he had a giant flat earth sticker on his rocket about flat earth. So he had to start learning some of the terms. And because that's what they want to know. They, stuntman, that's one thing. But flat earth, that's a whole other animal. And he's still, he's still not believing it. And now he's claiming he's the biggest thing in flat earth and blah, blah, blah. So... Uh, anyway, that's that's the long version. The short version of that answer is uh, people are in it. People join the community because Flat Earth has changed them. They're not in it to be social. If you want to be social, there's tons of other groups. Tons. In fact, pretty much every other group to, to join besides ours. This one's called A Crazy Theory. Dear Mark, I have a crazy theory on the dome and what is outside of it. Now, it starts with a government project called the Philadelphia Project. <laughs> I am familiar with that. If not familiar with it, mind you, I've only seen a couple of your YouTube videos and it got me interested in learning what's on the outside of the dome. It's about the USS Eldridge and it's basically going through alternate dimensions. A few years ago, the Montauk Project happened. Now you talk about the booming on the dome and now this was their way of getting through the dome. But they didn't just didn't just went to another dimension. Woo, spelling and grammar here is tough. Uh, now, yes, they did get out of the dome, never been on the outside. Or if they have, I don't know, I'm not the government. <laughs> and I'm not saying all, this all happened, like I said, it's a theory, but anyway, what's on the outside of the dome is nothing literally. Uh, time and space, nothing exists on the outside. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, of course, it's the movie, sure. But that's only one dimension, or at least that transition dimension. If you guys know what I'm talking about, watch the Philadelphia Experiment, the movie. Uh, and there's a corresponding book called The Montauk Project. Very fascinating stuff. And I do believe in the Eldridge Project. I do. Um Anyway, say someone would get out of the dome and be in the void of nothing and simply go mad uh, and his mind would be turned off. Wow, that Skype thing was loud. Uh, that means if they break the dome, we would all be nothing and the world plate as we know it would turn to nothing in a matter of minutes. I have more on this topic, so on and so on. Uh, sincerely, the gaming uh, essay sage. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. I already know everything there is to know about the look. I'm older. So I heck, I practically saw the uh, the Philadelphia experiment back in the 80s when it was in the theater. In fact, I think I did. Uh, and then it was like a favorite on video for for a number of years. Uh, this one's called Southern Hemisphere Stars and Flat Earth. Hi, Mark. I've been viewing hundreds and hundreds of Flat Earth videos and feel like I'm nearly convinced uh, that you and the rest are correct and that the Earth is flat. There is just one issue. It's always something, isn't it? That I can't seem to find an answer on. I was hoping you could help. I live in Sydney, Australia and get up many times during the night. I look at the stars, especially the Southern Cross, as it's just beautiful. Every night the stars do a big circle across the sky like a rainbow, but huge. The center of this semicircle that has the stars crossing the sky is south where we are told the South Pole is. For all you in the Northern Hemisphere, I know where this is going. It all makes sense as the North Pole is in the center and the stars go round. Uh, this works whether the Earth is flat or a ball. But for us, the stars don't circle around the North Pole. They circle around what we were meant to believe, the South Pole, and they have a very Southern center and the semicircle. Every example of the flat Earth I've seen you and others do have the stars circling around the North Pole, so on and so on. Basically, he's and it's from Blake Stevens in Sydney, Australia. I'm not even going to finish the email because I know where he's going with this. The short version is, how can we have different stars in the north and the south? If it's a dome scenario. And it's like, uh, multiple projection systems. How's that? Stars that are based on region. And I say that because I have worked in simulations for a long time. Been there since the, the beginning of them. And they... Uh, Look, we can we can do anything you want with the sky, and we can base it off region. We can base it off uh, elevation. We can base it off individuals if we want, and it's not hard. 
And what I mean by that is, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you're looking at the belt of Orion. You have somebody, let's say, just on the other side of the equator, and he's looking at the belt of Orion too. And you think you're looking at the exact same belt of Orion, but the truth is you're not. And that, and it's done because of the weakness of human beings. Uh, I say a design of the human beings, where you can only be in one place at one time. You can only be in London or you can be in Rio. You can't be in both at the same time. And since you can, that's the case, you just change the display system. Who's going to know? You're not because you're not there in both places. I know that sounds a little existential, but it's true. There's some, there's some designs that are very, very easy to do. It's like a the God's magic trick. Moving on. This one's called, I watched your documentary and your million hit video. I'm going to help you out, even though I'll probably get in trouble. You or your constituents, your challenging paradigms, questioning conventional wisdom as a surrogate for the human sector of this part of the Milky Way. Oh boy. I'm encouraged, but like you're not thinking big enough. It goes beyond the US government, the Illuminati, the stonemasons, world governments. Thinking of the earth in terms of a petri dish is spot on, yet your conclusions regarding Antarctica's uh, high altitude nuclear explosions are off. I could educate you further, but like it comes at some risk to me. Okay, the fact that you said that sentence could educate you further, but like it comes at some risk to me, I'm in no hurry to be a martyr. Proving or disproving your beliefs isn't what is important. It's the fact you're challenging what you've been taught. The conventional wisdom, the great ridicule of the masses. One society's delusional or another society's enlightened. Cheers. Uh, and I won't give you his name. Um, again, cliffhangers. Don't give me cliffhangers. I don't, I'm, nothing I can do with them. Don't, don't tell me I could tell you more. But, you know, I'll wait for you to what? Respond? No, give it to me. I get a ton of emails. In fact, I'm, sec I'm a little worried when I get back to LA because I'm not going to be checking my emails when I'm gone. Uh, this one's called The World is Flat. Hi, I'm Mark. I'm Ashanti. Uh, not to be confused with my ex-girlfriend, Ashanti. Weird. Uh, but now I've figured out where they got the name. I didn't realize it was, it was an African name. I live in Cape Town, South Africa. I've been looking into the flatter theories for almost two years now. And to be honest, in the beginning, I was extremely dismissive about these theories until I started digging deeper. I want to spread the word here in Africa. People need to know the truth. Uh, the only issue is that in Africa, it's not very rich and the majority of the continent does not have YouTube or the internet. So how do we teach them? Boy, that's a tough one. I mean, do they even know about the globe? Uh, just, you probably have to do with books. Uh, anyway, would you come to Africa and help me create awareness? Sure. Sure. I'd, I'd go to Africa. I'd go anywhere. It's, uh, I mean, I'm not going to stay there, but I'll come to Africa. And, and I mean, you're probably going to have to do it with books or show movies on a screen. That's probably, I mean, send them the documentary. You're going to have to have it subtitled or I'll send you the clues and uh, I'll send the transcripts to the clues. You can translate it to African. My family thinks I'm a nutter for believing the world is flat and shun me for being gullible. I really want to open their eyes as well. They have been so brainwashed by NASA and school that they won't even allow the idea to float in their heads. I would love to join the education process. Regards, Ashanti Meter. Hmm. This one's called JC. Uh, hello, Mark. Have you ever come across the map from the United Nations Weather Service? Uh, it sure looks like the flat earth to me. The last image is when I make the milk of God or the elixir of life. And I take pictures of it with different light spectrum. It looks like this. Fascinating to me. Tell me what you think of the maps. I will send you the link if I can find it again. Look at the dates. I did not even look at this image. It's two megs. Huh. Yeah. United States uh, Weather Service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the, um, it's the AE map more or less uh, yeah rob skiba used this with the weathers uh, with the with the weather systems and it looks really way more elegant traveling around a, a circular map than it does a globe okay let's do a few more and call this one good this one's called jonathan hey mark huge strange world fan just recently began listening to tfr i've been going through the archives you had a co-host named Jonathan from Jersey. I got the episode in late 2015 where he was talking about the show Perceptions. I cannot find it. any references to it are in the archives. Just wondering what happened to him. Almost looked like he disappeared. He did disappear for all of 26 months. Uh, his percep Perceptions show was removed from TFR for reasons I'm not going to get into. And uh, I heard that just last month he, he reappeared. 
uh, or maybe even was this month, he reappeared. Uh, not video, but he had his channel, and I can't remember the name of his channel. Um, it, it popped up. It went active again after 26 months, and he released some some audio thing. But I have spoken to nobody who's talked to him. So hopefully someone will, uh, will talk to him, and he'll get back into this. This one's called, YouTube is blamed for the rise in flat earthers. That's from a British newspaper. Here we go again. You YouTuber, what have you done? Yeah, it's from the Daily Mall. YouTube blamed for the rise in flat earthers. Yeah, well, shocking. That's where most of uh, flat earthers live is YouTube. Okay, let's see if we can get two two more. Maybe we'll, we'll end on this one. This, we can probably end on this one. Flat Earthers from Gromingen, Netherlands. Dear Mr. Sergeant, first off, huge fan of your work with a friend. We become intrigued by the Flat Earther movement of which you appear to be a, if not the, prominent figure with some fellow students from the University of Groningen. One being a physicist, we had a couple of questions we hope you could answer. One, at which altitude uh, do you think we could see the whole Earth, uh, being all the continents? Uh, for what, the Flat Earth? No idea. Uh, if the flat earth model is at least 20,000 miles wide from coast to coast, not border to border, but coast to coast, uh, then you'd have to be hundreds of miles high, if not a thousand miles high, I would think, at the very least. Two, do you also think the moon is flat? Uh, don't know. Maybe. Uh, it could be two-dimensional, it could be three-dimensional, but what we do know for sure, it is self-illuminated. Three, could it be possible that the earth is constantly accelerating through space in order to account for gravity? Yes, but you don't have to. There doesn't have to be space. And that that the way you worded the question, it kind of traps you, which is why does there have to be space? If you're in a building, you don't have to be accelerating upwards through space. You can just create gravity. Uh, you can just simulate gravity, whatever you want to call molecular magnets that that is gravity. No, I mean, yes, of course, you could do the same thing by accelerating through uh, an area, of course. But that seems like a lot of work because then you've got a building that's actually moving through something and you've got to create a lot more space and a lot more. I mean, you've got to create an area for it to fly through. It's like it's like creating a here's a perfect example. Oh, this is a great example. I didn't even think of this. And that is um, in a car. Let's say you want to simulate the, the driving effects of punching, punching the gas, the accelerator on a car. Right. Well, you could either make a car and make a highway and do it, you know, drive, or you could just tip the car up to where you're pressed back into the seat. See what I mean? You say, well, that's gravity. It's like, yeah, it is, but it's easier. You may, basically you can just, that's why car simulators and flight simulator, flight simulators are even better than that. Uh, flight simulators simulate gravity, even though, you know, G forces, even though you're not actually flying anywhere. If the simulator works, that's what you go with, the simulator. Anyway, sorry. Thank you for your time and knowledge. We are looking forward to your answers. Sincerely, Enzo Bacara and his fellow students from the Netherlands. So I sent him an email and explained all this, and uh, hopefully he'll listen to this as well. Anyway, thank you guys. I'm going to be off to Los Angeles in the morning uh, to do the QE 2019, if you guys didn't already know, it, the Question Everything conference with uh, Robbie Davidson and Matt Long and uh, Patricia Steer and um, Paul on the Plane, a lot of great people. And uh, if you want to go down there, great, fantastic. Uh, and then I'll be back sometime next week. So that's it. Send your emails to msargent23 at comcast.net. That's M-S-A-R-G-E-N-T 23 at comcast.net. And until next time, guys, stay flat.